Please rise. May the God of hope fill you with complete joy and peace as you continue to believe, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Here again, words written for us in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who have fallen asleep, so that you do not grieve in the same way as others who have no hope. Indeed, if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, then in the same way, we also believe that God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep through Jesus. In fact, we tell you this by the word of the Lord. The Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up in the clouds together with them to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. You may be seated. My dear friends, I hope, I hope we get, we get plenty of snow up in the mountains for a great ski season. I hope. I hope work isn't too crazy today and I can make some real progress on that project. I hope, I hope my team wins this weekend. I hope the Beavers get a good bowl game. I hope the Ducks get a chance at the national championship. Or maybe I hope that they don't. I hope. I hope my kid grows up in the faith and has every opportunity to flourish in this life. I hope. I hope our voters meeting doesn't go too long and I get a chance for my afternoon nap. I hope. I want. I wish. But who knows? We need hope to live. We need that hope to keep us moving forward. But we know better than to depend on our hopes. We tell ourselves, don't get your hopes up. We hope, but we prepare to be disappointed. I hope. When you hope, it will either happen or it won't. If it starts raining in the mountains, the ski season's not going to be good. When three co-workers call in sick and everything breaks, your chance of a productive work day are flush down the toilet. Your team will either win or they will lose. The world will either return to sanity or it won't, and who knows if the next generation will pre be prepared for the mess that we are leaving behind. The meeting, it will be over when it's over. You can hope all you want, the reality won't change. At some point, the time for hoping is done. Nothing seems more final than death. The body expires with one last breath. The heart beats at last. Whatever that life looked forward to comes to an end. Whatever that life failed to accomplish, it will remain undone. It's done. It's over and nothing we can do will change it. It seems like the time for hope is through. But Paul says that even in death, Christians have hope. You always have hope. Today, as we consider these great words of comfort, they are an encouragement for our whole lives. You always have hope. Because King Jesus have, has conquered sin and death, you wait for the first day of eternal life. For those early Christians, Jesus wasn't an entry in an encyclopedia or a discourse in a long theology textbook. 
He walked among them in living memory. They met people who knew Jesus. Paul shared his story about how he interacted with Jesus to them. So, when Jesus said, I am going to prepare a place for you, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come back so that you can be where I am. When he said, I am coming soon, his return was as real to them as he was. It felt imminent. It was right there. And so, like tidying up for company, like preparing for Christmas, they lived in expectation of that day. Then, death visited the congregation. They weren't expecting that. That wasn't what they were preparing for. So Paul assured them not even death could change their hope. We do not want you to be uninformed about those who have fallen asleep so that you do not grieve in the same way as others who have no hope. You see, death always brings grief. God has written eternity on our hearts and death seems to cut that short. A longing for something higher than this is Fills, is filling us, and death brings that longing to an end. It stops a person from reaching their goals. Death seems to thwart justice. The good are taken far too soon. And in the grave, the evil seem to escape the consequences of their actions. No one can figure out what is on the other side of death. And so every culture has its own theories about what will happen. Perhaps we will wander the underworld, enjoy Elysium, feast in Valhalla, be, in re, re, be reincarnated until reaching Nirvana, or as many hold today, simply drift away into nothingness. At best, all those are just guesses based on what we are looking at with our own thoughts and our own feelings in this world. At best, they are pleasant stories to teach us how to live our lives to be heroes or to live as good people to attain for something better. At worst, it's just wishful thinking. And wishful thinking is not going to satisfy your grief in death. No true comfort comes through these uncertain hopes because without any certainty, these hopes are no hope at all. Death brings grief. And these offer no comfort. Death always brings grief. And that means that we too will mourn. But we do not mourn as if we have no hope. Because we don't wonder what waits on the other side of death. St. Paul says, Indeed, if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, what the witnesses saw actually happened. They crucified him as he bore the sins of the world and suffered under the full wrath of God. He breathed his last. He surrendered, surrendered his soul to God the Father. Roman executioners plunged that spear into his side, bringing forth the flow of blood and water. And so Jesus died. No one in Jerusalem that day of Passover would deny that Jesus died. His cold, lifeless body was hastily prepared for burial and then laid to rest in the tomb. The women went to the tomb, but his body wasn't there. He appeared to them, and he told them, Go tell my disciples. He appeared to Peter, to two on the road to Emmaus, to the twelve, to more than five hundred, and finally to the apostle Paul himself. And so Paul says, If this historic fact is the foundation of your faith, if the work of Jesus is where we place our trust, if Jesus died and rose, then, in the same way we believe, that God will bring with him all those who have fallen asleep. 
He will bring them with him through Jesus. After World War II, Germany was divided between the Soviets and the Free West. Berlin, its capital, although deep within Soviet territory, was also divided. A precarious agreement was made so that the West could deliver supplies to West Berlin until the road was blocked. The West acted decisively. It was their city. It was their territory. Even if it lay behind enemy lines, nothing would stop them from keeping it and supplying it. A near non-stop convoy of planes flew to Berlin to bring the necessities of life. They had freedom there, and by sheer force of will, they would keep it. Death certainly seems to lay behind enemy lines. The wages of sin is death. When Eve gave the fruit to Adam and they ate, death entered the world and their perfect relationship with God was severed. All the longing of every human heart on earth would always be left unfulfilled. And then Jesus took the territory. The Lord of life submitted himself to death. God's flesh rested in the grave. And on the third day, he woke up again. Jesus rose. He lives. And so that is his territory now. And he's not about to cede control. He knows the way in. He knows the way out. He knows exactly what we need. And so that no one who trusts in him will ever be abandoned to the grave he supplies his people with what they need. Through his perfect life, all righteousness has been fulfilled. Through his innocent death, God's justice has been done. Through his resurrection, the gate to life has been opened, and he promises what he has opened, no one can shut. For those living in Berlin, the sound of those planes landing and taking off was the sound of hope. They were not abandoned. My friends, when the sorrows of life overwhelm us, when guilt oppresses us, when death surrounds us, the gospel is the sound of your hope. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. You are not abandoned. Even when death draws near, your hope remains because Jesus has been there and death has been swallowed up in victory. Those who fall asleep in Jesus, God will bring to be with him through the path the Lord has opened. This is your certainty. You always have hope. The one who conquered sin and death lives to bring you life. Many let their imaginations run wild when it comes to the end of the world. In the movies and our popular culture, the apocalypse, that is, the final revelation of what will happen, the end is always bad. And the heroes are those who fight to stop the end from coming. What little they know of scripture is twisted into some epic fantasy, a struggle for life, as if this sinful world should never come to an end. Christians often add to the, conclusion, to the confusion. The imagery of Matthew, Ezekiel, Daniel, and Revelation stimulates our curiosity. Those words aren't so easy to understand. Since they describe spiritual realities beyond our reasoning or events yet to come, the theories abound. Some sift for signs, ways they can calculate when the last day will come. Others use the rich symbolism to build complex and terrifying scenarios. They abandon the simple instruction from Jesus and Paul and instead rely on the secret knowledge of their own minds. And when they do, when we are tempted to join them, when we allow ourselves to be deceived or confused, 
When we let go of the clear word of God, we lose this wonderful comfort God gives and we forfeit our ability to comfort others. It isn't all there is. But if these words were all we knew about the end of all things, it would be enough. Paul isn't guessing. He assures us this information comes directly from the source. In fact, we tell you this by the word of the Lord. We who are alive and left until the coming of the Lord will not go ahead of those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. And then we who are left, who are alive, will be caught up with him and in the clouds together with them to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Often when we have an exciting day planned, we struggle to fall asleep. We have so much on our minds, so many things we have to do in the morning that we can't stop thinking about it. We lay in bed and we think to ourselves, I need to go to sleep. I need to go to sleep. I need to go to sleep. But we just can't. And then when that alarm comes in the morning, we dread it because we got no rest. However, when you worked hard all day the day before and you got everything in its place and everything was ready to go and your body and your mind are tired, that bed is so inviting. You set your alarm and fall asleep nearly as soon as your head hits the pillow. On those rare occasions, the alarm is welcomed with joy rather than smacked in anger. The fear of death and the fear of the end of the world are the same. Uncertainty. Not just uncertainty of what will be, but the uncertainty of what we have done. If the humanity's goal is to make this world a better place, have we gotten there? Will we ever get there? So people hope they will find some cosmic snooze bar when the alarm sounds at the end of time. If the goal of your life is to be a good person, to accomplish everything you set yourself out to do, you can never be ready for the end. You can't be ready for death. It is a hopeless struggle. People lie on their deathbeds clinging to every moment of life reaching for anything they can do to prolong every moment because they don't know if they are ready. Their hope isn't really hope. And in the end, wishful thinking offers no comfort. How different it is for those who believe the word of the Lord. My friends, the long, exhausting day is right now. All those terrifying signs and images from Revelation, they are happening all around us in the world. They have been happening for 2,000 years. Jesus left his church with work to do, and she has been hard at it. He has placed work into your hands, and that labor is not easy. As long as you draw breath, as long as the sun still rises, God is telling you you still have work to do. But that moment that God says your work is done, your grave will be as welcome to you as your bed. Jesus has gone ahead to prepare rest for your body and rest at his side for your soul. The morning for the first day of eternity will soon dawn. That alarm will sound, and the dead in Christ will leap from their beds on that day. For those still living, that wake-up call will be the end of work whistle. Hard labor will be over, and the day of eternal joy has, taken, has come. 
Your flesh will rise. Your eyes will see Christ. Your ears will hear his voice. Your flesh will feel his embrace. He will pronounce your judgment for all the world to see. Well done, good and faithful servant. Come and share your master's happiness. All believers living and dead will join you. You will watch with wonder as Jesus makes all things new. Paradise will be remade. As Adam and Eve walked in the garden, so Paul says, we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, Paul says, encourage one another with these words. You always have hope. Your loved ones who have died in Christ, they are not lost. They live on in more than your memories, for they live with Christ. They rest from their labors, and they are waiting along with us, waiting joyfully for the day of the Lord. What a joyful reunion we can expect in him. Therefore, encourage each other with these words. My friends, you always have hope. You never have to wonder if you have done enough. Christ is your righteousness. Christ is your forgiveness. Christ is dwelling in you so that you will produce much fruit. When that call comes, all your sins and failings, they will be forgotten, covered in the blood of Christ. Only your good works remain. And God himself will praise you as he welcomes you into his kingdom. Therefore, encourage each other with these words. You always have hope. Even when we seem to be living in the worst pages of Revelation, when the enemies surround us and the path seems impossibly dark, nothing will stop the Lord. This is a hope to sustain us. This is a hope to encourage us. This is a hope for which we can wait with complete confidence. You always have hope. And therefore, at the end of this church year, let us end with the final words of our Lord. Look, I am coming soon, and my reward is with me to repay each one according to what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes so they, will be, so they may have right to the tree of life and so that they may enter through the gates of the eternal city. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to give you this testimony for the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright morning star. The one who testifies about these things says, Yes, I am coming soon. Amen. Please rise. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with all his saints. Amen. We join in singing the Create in Me. <laughs>